Hi, good morning and welcome to Kendrick's Creek. My name is Steve Hopkins and this is Lily. And we're going to um, open up just with a time of prayer as we gather together in worship today. Uh, so if you would invite you to bow your heads and let's pray together, okay? Um, Father, we thank you for today and thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together. Pray that you would uh, bless this service, that everyone who's gathering here, that you would um, open them up to your love and your presence and your peace in the midst of this time. Uh, pray that your spirit would be upon them and to anoint them to receive your message and your grace and that you'd raise them up to new life in Christ and then bring change and transformation in and through them. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Lily's keeping me honest and keeping me on track, right? Okay, so let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Can you help me? Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Whoa. Good job, kiddo. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, whoa, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, can you believe, can I tell you something? Can you believe that a couple of weeks ago, I actually forgot the Lord's Prayer as I was praying it? And we had to stop the recording and start over because I like totally forgot it in the middle of it. Can you believe that? Uh-uh. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. Okay, couple announcements, and then you can give your special announcement. Deal? Deal. Okay. Um, subscribe to our email list. It's it's a link in this post. Uh, check that out. Do subscribe so we can stay in touch with you at the week. If you are a visitor or guest with us today, special welcome to you. Please just take a minute to fill out that connection card. Love to get to know you better and stay in touch with you. Um, if you know anyone who's having a hard time with bills during this time, hard time financially, they can see you. They can see you waving. They've watched you the whole time. Um, let us know. We have access to some funds and some resources to help people out during this time. It's a way that we can continue to be generous um, and hopefully um, just give back what we've been given. And so if you would like to give and continue to give to support our work and ministry here, please do that. You can find the link, the online giving link in this post um, or in church online. Um, or you can text Kendrick's Creek to 77977, or you can always mail in cash or check, or I guess if money orders are still a thing, I don't know how we'd get those, but um, anyway, online giving, cash check, you can do all those things, and we so appreciate how you give. Uh, last thing, it is still prayer week. This is our first Sunday in prayer week. Um, special message coming up in a few minutes, but just thank you for how you've engaged so far. Thank you for how you're gonna continue to engage. And please sign up for that online, unitedprayer.us. Still a week left to do that and to participate together. Um, anything else you got? I just want to say, keep loving God. <laughs> Good words. All right, <laughs> see you all in a minute. One of the things that's been so hard for people during the last few months is that places like barbershops and hair salons haven't been open. Um, and so people just haven't been able to get their hair cut. And, and that's been really hard for some people. It was a little hard for me. I mean, my hair was about as long as it's been in 12 years. So uh, that was kind of a challenge. Same with the beard. It was getting pretty long. So I got a trim this last week, uh, which was good on a number of levels, not least of which is that I came to realize there is a particular hazard that comes with having a longer beard and having a two-year-old. And it's so the two-year-old, especially when like I put her to bed, she would like put her hand inside of my beard, which was like okay at first, um, until she then like grabbed it and used it as like a weapon against me, to, like pull on it to direct my head wherever she wanted to go. That was really unpleasant. And it's been particularly a problem like when I've been putting her to bed. Cause I'll be holding her and rocking her usually like read her a story. And then she finishes up like a little cup of milk before she goes to sleep. Like, um, cause who doesn't want a cup of milk right before they go to sleep? You know, I do. Um, and so she's there sleeping, got her cup of milk and like getting ready to fall asleep. Um, and then, you know, I will be like looking out the window or I'll be looking off somewhere else, just my mind wandering. And then she'll do this. She's been doing it, right? Well, she grabbed my beard and she'd pull my face towards her. And I was like, oh, well, thank you. That was really unpleasant. Please don't do that. And then I'd go, like, you know, back to whatever I was doing, at which point she'd grab my beard and she'd pull my face towards her. 
And what I realized after a while is that she just wanted me to look at her. Like, well, she's there drinking her, but she just wants me to look at her. And of course, like if you've ever had kids, you know, this is true. I, I've seen this in Lily's life um, where, where various, so she has done ballet for the last couple of years because everything going on, she hasn't been able to do ballet. And so she's been taking to doing ballet on her own and creating all sorts of, you know, pretty elaborate musicals with like Barbie and then bringing them all into it and like creating some elaborate plot line. She's got a great mind for stuff like that. And then, and then acting out some kind of dance. And then she'll do this thing that like, I think we all know what's coming next. She'll be like, Hey dad, watch me. Hey dad, you watching me? Dad, watch my dance. Dad, 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 watch my dance. Are you, are you, are you looking? Dad, you're not looking. I see that you're looking at your phone. Can you look at me? Look at me. Dad, look at me. And he's like, okay, stop it. I get it. Okay, I'm looking at you. What more do you want from me? I'm trying here. Like, I'm sorry I took my eyes off you for a couple seconds. They say kids just want their parents to look at them. That's the revelation that I had. Maybe you already knew that. That's not news to you. Um, it sort of wasn't news to me, but it was just impressed upon me last week. Is it like, man, they just wanted me to look at them. And so often, that's just what we want in our lives in general, right? Is that we just want to know um, that God is looking at us. Because when someone is looking at you, is that we know that they're there and they're present to us. And so we talked last week about prayer, about how we're moving into prayer week and how we're now there. Um, and how so much of it is about being with God. And as much as anything, it's that we just want to know that he's there that he's like watching us. And that so often we can just be like, be like Lily and just be like, dad, dad, look here, watch me, watch me. Are you here? Are you watching me? We just want to know that he's looking at us. The good news that, uh, of the kingdom of God is that God is there and he is watching you. The great blessing that God gives to Aaron to bless the people of Israel, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his gaze upon you and give you his peace. It's a great promise, and it's the, 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 the message and the heartbeat of prayer. And uh, so um, we understand it's, it's the, the idea of being just simply in the presence of our Father and that his kingdom comes with his presence. Uh, and so we talked last week about how the prophet Ezekiel, the exiles um, in Babylon, how he spoke and he prophesied, he taught them about this whole idea of the presence of God and the kingdom of God, no matter where they are, no matter what they're going through, that God can be with them and that he will walk with them through a variety of situations. And so we're just going to continue on that theme of Ezekiel, kind of as we talked about last week, but, but seeing how, how this kind of changes over time. That if the foundation principle of prayer is being with God, then maybe the second step of it is like, what is God then doing in me as a result of prayer, right? Because like there's two parties, you know, there's God and then there's me. And if we talked last week about sort of, well, what is God's thing in this? Then, then maybe the second part is like, well, what am I doing here? And what's happening in me as I pray? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. If you want to, you can go to Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37. We're going to start in 36 and then move into 37. I invite you to follow along with that. Uh, this is comes to us, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 um, through 27. Just start, start here. Um, this is what Ezekiel says. Um, this is a promise from God to Ezekiel, to the people. And it says this, he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be cleansed. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey all my regulations. Um, man, that's a good word. And it's so interesting because when we talk about the heart, like that, that is kind of weird language for us. I mean, we use it all the time, don't we? Like in songs and movies and poetry, like it's used all the time. We talk about the heart um, as being like something that is important and intrinsic and essential to our emotions. Um, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. I just want to follow my heart. Uh, my heart beats for you, all this kind of, you know sappy stuff that maybe you find on like Hallmark cards is great stuff. I don't know. Just, but what do we do with that? Right? Cause we know that like actually our heart is a muscle and it beats and it pumps out blood. And like, it doesn't actually have anything to do with our decisions or our thoughts or our mind or our words. The heart has zero to do with that. 
the heart is essential to life, but it doesn't have anything to do with how I function and think and act, right? And so we have to remember that the ancient people, they didn't think of that it actually did either, right? They, they understood what the heart did, like the anatomical thing inside of you, that they understood that, that it did not actually make decisions for them. But when they spoke about the heart, they were talking about it, it was the seat of their will. It was the seat of the mind and of decision-making in a human being. And so when they talk about the heart, that's what they're talking about, the seat of the mind and of decision-making and of the human will. It's important for us to understand that because the Bible talks a lot about the heart. And so here in this, in, this, in this particular passage, we hear Ezekiel says that I will give you a new heart. God says, I will put a new heart in you. Because obviously maybe something was wrong with the old heart. Um, and specifically what he says, I will put a new heart in you. I will take out your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. Which we've all heard of the, the kind of saying like someone has a hard heart. Usually it means that they're kind of, you know, maybe a little bit cruel, maybe a little closed off, maybe um, just not receptive in any given situation. That's why you say someone has a hard heart. Uh, but there's actually more to it going on here when Ezekiel and God use this particular imagery. You see, in the ancient world, uh, there was this understanding that was heavily influenced by the idea of the Egyptian afterlife. Now, you probably didn't think that I was going to be talking about Egyptian mythology today, but like that's where we're going today. You didn't see it coming, but here it is. Um, in the Egyptian mythology, the Egyptian afterlife, the heart was, again, the, the seat of decision-making and of the mind and of the will. And so there's two metaphors at play here that, that we talk about this idea of having a heart of stone. The first is that because the heart, like that language was used to talk about the seat of the mind and of the will and of decision making, then when uh, bodies in Egypt, when they died and then they were mummified, y'all know mummies, right? I don't need to explain that. When the bodies were mummified, certain important organs and, and parts of the person from the inside were removed. And one of those was their literal heart. And so what happened is, is that their, their heart of you know, flesh and blood would be taken out of the body and it would be replaced with literally a stone heart. Who knew, right? It's crazy. But it was, this is interesting. They would take a heart of stone, they would carve it in the shape of a dung beetle, because the dung beetle was paradoxically their symbol for eternal life. And so this symbol of eternal life, a stone in the shape of a dung beetle, was then placed in the place of a heart inside of the mummified remains of a person. So to say that someone had a heart of stone, it meant that they were dead, literally, and that they just had this symbol placed in their chest where their heart of flesh no longer worked and functioned. The second part of it is that in just a different kind of sense, the heart being the seat of the mind and of the will and of decision-making uh, was said to either be heavy or light. And so the way this worked is that in their mythology, when someone died, the heart was weighed against a feather. Because a feather was a symbol of truth, a symbol of justice. And if your heart was as light as a feather, heard that expression before? If your heart was as light as a feather, then you were considered a pure, innocent, worthy person. And you could inherit a, a kind of heaven-like existence. But if your heart was heavy, if it was heavy like a stone, then it would cause the scales to tip and to sink. And then you would, of course, go off to your eternal punishment is the way this goes. And so I think when we hear what Ezekiel's saying and this promise that God gives is that when you come to me, I will cleanse you and I will take out your heart of stone and I will put within you a new heart, a heart of flesh. All of that comes into play. Because the problem is, is that like, as a human being, we are sinners. We don't always like to say those words. We don't always like to think about it that way. But the way that Paul says this is really helpful. He says this in Ephesians 2. He says, once you were dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins. Like you were dead as a result of sin. As a result of sin, your mind, your will, your decision-making is like a heart of stone inside of you. It is like your body is physically dead and where there should be a living, beating heart, it has been replaced with this heart of stone placed inside of you. As a result of sin, you are guilty. Like not just in some kind of ethereal, kind of spiritual sense. No, like... You carry guilt around with you. 
You know, it's just, it's a sad and really heartbreaking consequence of sin in the lives of human beings is that we, we can easily be ashamed and feel guilty and be embarrassed by stuff that we know at one level is wrong, but that we don't want to do, but we feel like we're on this inevitable crash course to do it. All of that comes into play here. It says that as human beings, you have a heart of stone. Just naturally, it's just what happens. It's, and it's sad and it breaks God's heart. And he does not want that for you. In the New Testament, there's another word that's often used when we talk about sin. And we talk about that kind of spiritual death that results. Um, and it's not always just death. The, the authors in the New Testament, they use a different word. They use this word of sleep, um, where they talk about this idea that like, if you were dead in your sins, that it's like you were asleep to the spiritual reality of God's kingdom and the world around you. Um, and sleep is a funny thing, you know, cause like the weird thing about sleep is that you don't know you're sleeping when you're sleeping. Like you don't know that you need to be woken up until like you're already, you're already awake. Um, I've seen this just with my kids, you know, like I will go into Lily's room, uh, right before she goes to bed or like what we obviously put her to bed, but then like once I go to bed and I'll go into her bedroom and like go check on her and just see how she's doing see what's going on. Uh, make sure everything's okay, and usually just give her like a little kiss goodnight and then scoot out of there before she knows that I was in there. And 10 times out of 10, she is sound asleep when I go into her room right before I go to bed. 10 times out of 10. If I had a nickel for every time that she woke up the next morning and I said, how'd you sleep last night? She said, I didn't sleep at all. Didn't sleep a wink, dad. Don't know what you're talking about. Like I'd be a rich man, but see, she doesn't know. She doesn't know that she was sound asleep until she is then awake, right? And, and until you, you get woken up. It's this hard thing that we so often have to deal with um, is that all of us in that same sense, like we are asleep to the kingdom of God. And until it's time for us to wake up, like we don't know that we're asleep. Uh, until something is acted upon you from the outside, then you don't know that you need to wake up. Like most people can't wake themselves up. Once you've been awakened, you can will yourself to then get out of bed. But most people can't wake themselves up. You have to have something outside of you do it, whether that's an alarm clock, whether that's the birds chirping outside, whether that's somebody rolling over and smacking you, whether that's the sun pouring in through your window, whether that's some sound from you. Something needs to act upon you to really make you wake up sometimes. And that's what it's like when we talk about sin and we talk about the reality of our spiritual condition apart from God? Is it like we are dead? We are asleep. We have a heart of stone. Like it is not living. It is not breathing. Um, all of which brings us to this picture that Ezekiel paints for the people in Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, everything that he says like before that about the hardest, it, it points to this. And he's illustrating what he's talking about here. And so he starts out in chapter 37. I just want to read this to you. It says, the Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? To which Ezekiel replies, well, sovereign Lord, only you know the answer to that. I just want you to stop and to, to get a picture of what Ezekiel is saying here. Is to look at, just, if you need to close your eyes to visualize this, then close your eyes. Nobody judging you in your living room. Close your eyes and just picture what Ezekiel is seeing. That God takes him to a valley in the desert, a dry, desolate, dead valley. And all before him are just like skeletons, just dry bones. Just dry, dusty bones, like de decompose. Like there's nothing there, just bones. And then God asks him. This, I mean, it's a scene of like carnage, right? We don't know how this happened. We don't know where this comes from. Some people have theorized that like it's possible that God led Ezekiel to see a certain kind of like ancient burial ground. Some different religions in the ancient world just laid the bodies on the ground and. The, until like they were picked clean and that the, you know, something to do with like, this would be the way that their spirit could ascend into the afterlife. Some people have proposed that we really don't know. Some people have proposed that this is just 
the, the aftermath of one of the battles that the Babylonian Empire would have fought. Because sometimes like in a battle, um, especially in the ancient world where you had, you're just fighting hand-to-hand combat, that like sometimes when people fell and they died, you didn't have time, especially if you lost, you couldn't like bury all the bodies. And so they would just lay on the battlefield until eventually nature took its course and the bodies went away. So we don't know how this happens. Uh, We don't really know much about this. We just know this is what Ezekiel sees. And that if you saw that, you'd probably be a little freaked out. Like, let's just face it. If you just walked out and you saw a valley full of dry, dead bones, like that's uncomfortable to say the least. And then God asks Ezekiel this question. He says, Ezekiel, son of man, son of Adam, can these old bones live? And Ezekiel answers in the only way that he possibly can. He's like, God, I don't know. Doesn't look like it to me, be honest with you, but only you know the answer to that. So God continues and he says, Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy to the bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath in you and make you live again. I'll put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath into you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Uh, And of course, that's what Ezekiel does. And so he, he speaks to the bones and he says, old bones, come back together. And he says, put flesh and blood back over them. And that's exactly what happens. It says that I spoke this message just as God told me. And suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves to complete skeletons. Like you'd be really freaking out right now. This is face it. This is weird. And he says, then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover their bodies, but still they had no breath in them. Now, Ezekiel came upon a valley full of dead and dry bones. But then that valley full of dead and dry bones, when he spoke to the bones, they then became like bodies again, and they looked like they should have been alive, except they weren't alive. This is like, This is like your worst zombie nightmare, you know? Like these bodies looked the part, but they weren't alive. And and I think that that there's some really important lessons in there for us. The thing that they're missing is they had no breath in them. So in the Hebrew, which is this word called ruach, in the Greek is this word pneuma. You ever heard pneumonia? It's got to do with the same Greek word. Um, Both of those words are translated as spirit. But they also, in those languages, they also mean breath and wind, the spirit, the soul, right? The, these words, they all the same word, but used in a variety of different ways. This is that these bones, these bodies now that look the part, they had no spirit in them. They had no breath in them. They didn't have that very animating feature that would have brought life to their bodies. They looked the part, but they weren't alive. And here's the important lesson to us is that number one is that how easy is it for any of us to look the part, but not really be alive? How, how easy is it for us to go through our life with like, you, you look completely good on the outside, but on the inside, the very breath and the spirit of God is not there and is not animating you and is not driving you and is not causing and leading your decision making. You have still a heart of stone, but on the outside, you look so good. This is what Jesus, I mean, Jesus talked a lot about this. He said, beware of people who just look the part. Beware of people who, who put on a show so that other people can see how good they look, but on the inside, their heart is not right. Beware of people whose hearts are far from me. Jesus is super concerned about not just what's on the outside. I mean, that you can fake that. He's concerned about what's on the inside, about your heart. He wants you to have a living heart because he says what, where your heart is, then, then everything else will flow out from that, right? The, from your heart will flow a life, a life of righteousness or a life of death. It's one of the two. He says it's all from your heart. And so just simply looking good on the outside, it's not enough. What Ezekiel did is he spoke to the bones and they raised up and they looked the part, but they weren't alive. And they were missing something. And part of the problem is that they were missing the very breath of God. And so what God tells me next, he says, Ezekiel now prophesied of the breath, prophesied of the wind, 
prophesy to the Spirit and say, fill these old bags of bones and put life in them again. And that's important for us to hear because as long as Ezekiel was talking one man to a bunch of bones, nothing happened. I mean, it looked the part, but they weren't alive. They weren't alive. And this is, it, it took Ezekiel speaking to God on behalf of the bones and on behalf of these bodies that had no life in them for them to be filled with the life-giving spirit of God. You can't save people. Some of you need to hear that. Honestly, that's one of the things that stands out to me about this passage. You can't save people. You can't change their heart. You can't put life and spirit and breath in them. Only God can do that. Only God can change a stubborn, stony heart in a human being. Maybe you need to hear that too. Maybe you need to hear that not just because of people who are in your life around you. Maybe you need to hear that because of you. Maybe you've been thinking that like there's some things in your life that you want to change and you've been trying to change them and you haven't been able to change them. You're not going to be able to fix it. Maybe you didn't want to hear that today. I'm going to tell you again, you're not going to be able to fix it. Only God can do that. And as long as you're the one who's trying to fix it, as long as you're the one who's trying to fix anything in anyone's life, including yourself, if you're the one who's trying to change it, you're only going to get so far. You can affect a lot of change. It's a lot of change for a bunch of dry bones on a desert floor to be brought back up onto their feet and to have like flesh and blood and skin covering them again. That's a lot of change, but it's not alive. It's not living like God wants us to be alive. It takes the spirit of God and the spirit of God alone to bring that kind of change into the life of a human being. Um, and that's why he says to Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath, which is exactly what Ezekiel does, which is exactly what Jesus says is the way that you must enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says in John 3, he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God, but by the spirit of God, by the water and the spirit, by the water and by the breath. That is the only way that you can enter into the kingdom, the rule, the reign, and the authority of God. You must be born again by the Spirit. Look, only God can save human beings. And only by the Spirit of God does that happen. And John Wesley defined that as grace. Uh, I think that's how the Bible defines grace. It is God's activity in our life. We have to get that. Like Grace is not just something that you don't deserve. Of course you don't deserve it. You don't deserve God's activity in your life. But it's his activity in your life that is unmerited. It is his favor poured out upon you. But it is his activity that is working in you to save you. To bring you and breathe life into you. To bring eternal life into you. That it would dwell within you. And that you would be changed from the inside out. That he would take out that stubborn, stony, dead heart. And replace it with a living, beating heart again. Like that the source and the seat of your decision making and your mind and your will would be completely remade and renewed in his image and in his likeness. That's so good for us to get. Uh, it goes back to this way even from the very beginning. You remember the story in Genesis? Genesis 2 says, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, but Adam was just a body on the ground until God breathed his breath into him. Remember, until God breathed his spirit into him, then he became alive, alive with the character and the quality of life that characterizes the kingdom of God, a life filled with righteousness and joy and peace in any circumstance, a life that's characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, no matter what is happening outside of you, the promise of the good news of the kingdom of God, the gospel, is that you can have all of those things inside of you as you have eternal life, a knowledge of God, an intimate relational knowledge of him, living life with him throughout the course of your daily life. That's the gospel. No matter what's going on out there, in here, you can experience a life that is better than anything you could even begin to imagine. And, and of course, the hard thing for us is that in all of us, there's those parts of us that are dead. There's those parts of us that have not been reborn into the kingdom of God. 
Uh, there's those parts of us that like, that like we just haven't fully surrendered yet. Maybe there's some of you that you haven't surrendered any of it yet. Uh, maybe for some of you, you've like given a little bit, but you're still holding back. Maybe you've given a lot of it, but you know that there's still some parts in your, in your life that you just haven't, you haven't opened up your hand to God yet. Um, and as you look at those areas or those people in your lives or those areas of your own life, you can kind of look at them. It's like, well, it looks like a bunch of dead, dry bones on a valley floor. And you kind of hear that question resonate. It's like, son of man, son of Adam, daughter of Eve, can those old bones live? Are they ever going to be changed? Is anything ever going to get better? Is that impossible? And so we just kind of turn to God and we say, well, God, you're the only one who knows. I want you to hear this promise that Paul gives us in Romans 8. He says this, he says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. If you believe in Jesus, if you trust him, his promise that I will give you my spirit, his breath, he will breathe it out into your life and they will also raise you up from the dead. It will wake you up to the kingdom of God. That's when Jesus, um, literally, uh, just reminded of the story, you hear about it in like Mark 5, for instance. It's this great story where this one, um, you know, synagogue ruler, his daughter is dead. And uh, like she literally dies. And Jesus goes into the room with Peter, James, and John. And he says, this little girl's not dead. She's just asleep. And everybody laughs at him. And they say, she's dead. What's this guy talking about? And he said, no, no, no. Like he literally, the, the original language, he says, she's just asleep. And then he leans over her and he says to her, Talitha kum, which is just like, like Aramaic is the equivalent of saying, little girl, time to get up. It's time to wake up. And she just leans over and his breath goes over her face. Listen, God wants to wake people up. Jesus is in the business of waking people up. He's in the business of resurrecting people, of bringing people up to new life in him, that breathing out the very spirit of the living God into you, that your body would be raised up to live a new kind and quality and character of life. That is what it means to be saved. It's not just about going somewhere sometime when I die, though that is an essential and and wonderful and profound truth that when we die, we can spend eternity with God in his kingdom of the heavens. But the message that Jesus wanted us to get even more than that is that the reason that that's possible is because we receive and we believe and we have have lived in the spirit and the kingdom of God right here, right now in the midst of our everyday life, that we would be a kind of people who would embody your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that because I live and believe and receive his spirit right now, that I will continue to live even though this body will die. That's the good news. Um, Jesus wants people to receive his spirit. He wants people to be alive to him. It's why after he was resurrected, he was with the disciples in, in an upper room, a closed room, and it says that he breathed on them. He said, receive my spirit. He breathed on them literally blew his spirit onto them. It's the promise um, that he promised them at Pentecost is that, look, I'm going to ascend and it's a good thing that I'm doing. Now I want you to go and wait and pray. And when the time comes, you will receive my spirit. It will be poured out on all people. And it's in that posture of waiting that we wait in prayer. We wait in prayer. Jesus put it like this. Uh, in Luke 11, you can find it if you want to go look. He says, you know, you fathers, you earthly fathers, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. When they ask for something that they need, you don't give them something bad. Instead, you give them the things they ask for, right? He says, now, now if you earthly fathers do that, and you're, you know, sinful people who sometimes don't always get it right. He said, if you can do that, then how much more so will your father in heaven your good, good, perfect Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. The greatest gift that anyone could ask for, the very spirit of the living God to reanimate, redirect, and consecrate their life to his purposes. How much more so will he do that? Look, he wants you to receive his life. He wants you to receive his spirit. And so that's the, that's the thing on offer today. 
is I want you to just take a minute and to look at your life. To look at your life. Assess your life. If you don't know how to do that, then just pause and say, search me, God, and reveal to me my life. Ask him to show you your heart, the seat of your mind and of your will and of your decision making. And say, is this this fully alive in the kingdom of God? Where are those places in your life that you are not fully alive to the kingdom of God? That you are not um, living under his authority and his rule and his reign? Ask him to show you those, what those are like. Uh, so that first step, like you have to recognize there's a problem in order for any kind of change to come. And so the first part is like, Lord, what is, what is there in my life that is not of you? What is there in my life and in my thinking and in my mind that is, that, like I am asleep to your kingdom in those places? I mean, what is it? And what are you working for, right? It, maybe it's in your identity. Maybe it's in, in your whole understanding of your, who you are. Uh, Maybe it's just in different areas and pockets of your life, maybe money or in your sexuality or in whatever. Those different areas are so common for so many different people. Um, Where is it that that you're you're seeing this kind of incongruity? It just doesn't line up. Or maybe you know that that's true. Maybe um, you've been wrestling with it. Ask him to show you. Um, And the second thing is that Jesus says that we can receive his spirit um, if we just humble ourselves and we repent and we ask. Um, Jesus' message, you remember, is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, repentance is very simple at one level and kind of hard at another. It's very simple because all it is is re, it's just turning and reorienting our life to God. It's just turning away from our own way and turning toward God's way and just coming back to him. That's repentance. It is hard. It's hard because it requires humility. It's hard because it means that I have to acknowledge that I'm not perfect. It's hard because I have to acknowledge that I can't fix myself. It's hard because I have to acknowledge that I am not God and that I am not the king of my life. The last few weeks, I've been reading um, The Lord of the Rings, rereading favorite books of all time. Uh, I've been rereading those, and I came across a line this last week that really just hit me. Um, One of the characters, her name's Eowyn, she's she's like this really strong female character, um, and she's talking to Aragorn, who's like the long awaited and expected king who is returning to reign in his kingdom. A lot of, you know, metaphors at play here. Um, but she's talking with him and she's upset because she can't do what she wants to. She wants to go fight in this war, but she has duties and responsibilities uh, for her people. And she says, um, have I not earned the right to do what I will? I mean, to do whatever I want to, to live my life the way I want. And Aragorn responds to her and he says, few can do so with honor. Uh, Very few people in the world, arguably not many at all, who can just live their life however they want to and do it with any kind of honor and integrity. And that's a problem for so many of us. And that's why Jesus says we need to repent, to stop doing things our way and to turn and to humble ourselves before him and to to say, God, I... I need you to to show me. I need you to fix me. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. It takes humility. He says, if you humble yourselves before me and seek my face, I will heal you. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will lift you back up. His spirit will bring life back into you and raise you back on your feet. And so maybe I just like to lead us in a time of prayer as we close out today. Um, Just acknowledging maybe where there's some areas in your life that are not what you want them to be. Maybe it's your entire life is not what you want it to be. And to just, to repent and to come to God and say, okay, God, I confess. I'm not confessing because I'm waiting for you to, because I don't think that you will heal me until I confess. I'm confessing because it's important for us to understand that like we confess that God is already there. He knows exactly what's on your heart. He knows what you've done. He knows your sin. He knows your brokenness and he shows up anyway. That's why we confess, to receive and, and experience that healing. So I'd like to lead you in a time of prayer as we close out today. If you would just bow your heads, bow your hearts and pray with me. Um, Father, I ask that in this time, uh, you would search our hearts and our minds and our lives and reveal to us those areas um, that don't line up with your will. To reveal to us those spots and those moments in our lives that just that, that don't match. 
that we know it's contrary to your will. We know it's contrary to your laws. We know it's contrary to what you say is a good, rich, fulfilling, and abundant life. Um, And yet we have stubbornly resisted anyway. We ask you to search our hearts, God, and show us very clearly. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And if those don't come to mind, trust that you will give it to us in due time. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring life into those places. That you would breathe your very Holy Spirit into the dead places of our lives, those dry and dead places in our hearts, that you would breathe your spirit, that you would take out that heart of stone and replace it with a living, beating heart of flesh. Uh, That you would breathe your very breath into us and revive us, bring us back to life. Awaken us to the goodness of your love and of your kingdom. I pray that anyone out there who's really struggling with this, that they would just have open hands and, and, and that they would have faith and courage to ask. Just ask something like this. Say, God, I am sorry for my sin. And that whatever you've revealed to them, just to confess it. Say, I confess to you whatever sin it is that is in my heart, in my mind, in my life. And I repent. I turn from it and I turn towards you. And I receive your Holy Spirit. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your breath. And I, I receive your change. And I am raised to new life in Christ because the spirit of him who gives life to the dead places and dead things in the world, he gives life in me too. God, we bless you and we thank you for that gift. And I pray that everyone who's receiving this message today, that they would experience the goodness of a life with you. They would experience the presence of your Holy Spirit in them to bring about new things in them, to bring about new life in them to bring about some real change and transformation in them. We thank you for that gift and that grace. And where we know people around us who are in need of that, Lord, we lift them up to you. We surrender them to you. And we trust that in your way and in your time, your will will be done in their lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our King, and our life giver. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this week, guys. If there's anything that we can do for you, please do let us know. Have a great continued week of prayer. Still got a week left. If you want to sign up, you can do so at unitedprayer.us. And as always, anything that you want to share, any stories about how God's working in your life, man, we would love to hear it. Uh, Feel free to reach out and let us know. um, And and man, we'll be in touch. With that said, y'all have a great week. God bless you. He is with you. He is watching you. His face is turned towards you. And so you can go with confidence in the course of your life this week. Y'all make a great day and have a great week.